This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I don't know about Dirt, but um, uh, we'll see what we can do. In 1988, in the wake of much publicity about bogus degree mills operating in this country and giving UK higher education a bad name, the Education Reform Act made it a criminal offence to offer or to purport to award a degree or anything called a bachelor, master or doctor without the authority of a royal charter or an act of parliament. There's a limited defence to this new offence, which is available if an institution in the UK has already been granted power to award degrees by a foreign institution before 1988. Thus, for very practical <coughs> reasons, it was essential that there was a demonstrable continuity between the new Bellamy Institute and the ecclesiastical faculties of philosophy and theology that existed at Heathrock before it joined the University of London in 1970. In other words, the Bellamy Institute had to represent, at the very least, a revival of the Pontifical Athenaeum of 1964, and it was very important to try and establish exactly when those degree awarding powers were granted, as well as their precise scope. This paper is a very short account of some of the investigations into that question, with an attempt to set them against the background of the Church's developing universal law relating to higher education, or what we call higher education, and corresponding developments in the society's particular law in this regard. And if anyone wants a, a fuller copy, I'll give you an email address at the end. Um, although the investigations worked backwards from the present day, for the purposes of this presentation, I'd like to start at the beginning with a brief look at the college and the prevailing legal views at the time, uh, and then before moving rapidly on to more recent events. The reason for doing so is to avoid anachronistically, anachronistically projecting back to that time a modern and perhaps misconceived concept. The question we're looking to answer was, at what point in the college's history was it granted the power to award degrees? This question is cast in the language of the 1988 Act, but it's equally consistent with the language used in Roman documents. This concept is of the degree as a thing that one has, a qualification which is awarded, something that has value and currency because that value and currency is given to it either by the state or the church. Hence, in this model, the church or state has a monopoly on this type of qualification and is in a position to grant you a type of franchise without which you can do nothing. Now that is very far from the way things would have been regarded in 1614. A degree was a gradus, a step, which determined your domestic position within a particular institution. They were regulated by that institution alone, which determined the framework and the qualifications one needed to progress from one degree to another within the institution. What gave these internal degrees a wider currency was ultimately their local or universal recognition, particularly by similar institutions, and this was most likely to ensure when one of the two prevailing models, Bologna or Paris, was followed. This was the development of what we now refer to as the university, or studium generale, as they were termed at the time. This mutual recognition was at first the province of the community of scholars in Christendom, but this function was soon taken up by a combination, or perhaps a competition, uh, between church and state. But what was granted at that time was not the power to award degrees, but a privilege that the internal degrees of an institution would be recognised as conferring similar status in any other university to that which it conferred in the home institution. In particular, the jus ubique docendi, the right to teach anywhere, became an important part of the rights granted to the institution by the church or state. <coughs> Nevertheless, the rights granted to the institution still attached to the internal degree regulated by that institution. This right became inextricably linked with the degree we now variously know as licentiate, master and doctor. Many traces of this former understanding of the nature of the degree can be found in our higher education system. It is common for universities still to talk of admission to, rather than awarding of, degrees. And the associated ceremonies, particularly in the older universities, also reflect this. The full mutual recognition of the internal degrees of other institutions has an echo in the concept of the degree by incorporation, still practiced mutually by Oxford, Cambridge and Trinity College Dublin, a club that used to be much wider before the isolation from the continent in the centuries that followed the Reformation. There were exceptions. A monotechnic, or one teaching a purely local subject, could not attain such recognition, 
So, for instance, the Four Inns of Court in London, sometimes referred to as the Third University of England, admits to its own degrees of the Utter Bar and Master of the Bench. Whilst recognised by the courts and by each other, these degrees in a local subject, English law, could never be recognised universally. As late as 1967, the English courts ruled that one of the essential elements required for a university of common law was to have teaching in the higher faculties, usually including theology. In, 19, in 1826, the original London University, that which is now U, uh, UCL, was founded on the basis that it would admit students to its own degrees, and only later was there state intervention of the modern kind. Notwithstanding all this, by the time of the foundation of the college at St John's in Lerva, it had become the norm for an institution to obtain such universal recognition of its own degrees by petitioning, the, by, by petitioning the church or the state for a decree of recognition, rather than waiting for it to happen organic, organically as in former times. That is, unless one of the established one of those unless those establishing the college were already in possession of a privilege that accorded their institution such recognition automatically. Augustine Bayer states that certain religious congregations had such a privilege and strongly implied that the Society of Jesus was already in possession of such a privilege. A modest start on the work of creating and extending a central supervision of higher education was made uh, when Sixtus V created the modern Curia by the decree Amensi Attorney, uh, Attorney in 1588 which included the Congregatio Pro Universitate Studii Romani. This was largely charged with the oversight of the Roman University, although the documents do mention others. However, this congregation became moribund within a short space of time, and was probably already so by 1614. So we jump forward to the 19th century, and Leo XII creating the Congregation of Studies in 1824 originally to oversee the schools of the Papal State. Under the major reform of Roman Curia undertaken in 1908 by Pius X, partly in response to the loss of the Papal States, this congregation was given responsibility for all major Athenaea, or as they are called, universities or faculties, which depend on the authority of the Church. The congregation was given the competence to approve new institutions, to grant the faculty to confer academic degrees, we've got that language then coming in by then, and to confer such degrees itself on good men, and that was used in the exclusive sense in the document. Seven years later, Benedict XV transferred jurisdiction over seminaries to the new congregation from the consistorial, consistorial congregation where they would remain with the Congregation for Studies and Education until transferred to the Congregation for Clergy by his namesake in 2013. These relatively new provisions uh, from 1908 were reflected in the 1917 Code of Canon Law. So at the time the province brought, brought its theologate and philosopher back together to reform its Collegium Maximum in Oxfordshire, the universal law in this field remained relatively undeveloped. For the first time, comprehensive legal competencies had been clearly established, but detailed norms had not yet emerged. Perhaps in anticipation of such a move, we see at this time the emergence of the society's Ratio Studiorum Superiorum. This appears to have developed as an offshoot of the society's more general Ratio Studiorum of 1599, um, which had been written about extensively elsewhere and arose from the 27th General Congregation held in 1923, when the Society, explicitly responding to the provisions contained in the new Code of Canon Law, reworked and assembled into one place the various degrees of, de decrees of the congregations relating to, of, of the, that's the congregations of the Society relating to higher studies. The Ratio Studiorum Superiorum contained detailed provision covering the organisation of the curriculum, the governance of studies, and the work of the teachers, with the section on governance being the longest. In 1931, Pope Pius XI issued Deus et Scientarum Dominus, the first really comprehensive universal legislation applicable to all universities and faculties which taught the sacred sciences with the authority of the Holy See and had the right to confer academic degrees. 
This legislation was accompanied by more, more detailed ordinances issued a few weeks later by the Congregation for Studies. This legislation obliged all such, such institutions to revise their statutes to bring them in line with the new universal discipline. This included all the society's colleges, and this work was done swiftly. Within a year, the Superior General had is issued transitional norms for all Jesu Jesuit colleges, pending confirmation of the revised statutes. New temporary statutes for all the colleges were approved by the Congregation, together explicitly with the right to confer academic degrees, uh, and was obtained from the Congregation in September 1932. Sig significantly, this Roman Recognitio explicitly included the power for those colleges listed to confer ecclesiastical degrees, and for Heathrop, this grant, or confirmation, uh, covered degrees in the faculties of both theology and philosophy, although it would appear at this time to have excluded the doctorate in philosophy. The Ratio Studiorum Superiorum was issued in a number of revised editions during the mid-20th century, ending in 1954. John O'Malley, writing in 2000, describes the document as having re reached a state of semi-official but definitive retirement by the middle of the 20th century. He thinks that the last edition was 1941. The fact that he's unaware of the 1954 version simply probably serves as further evidence uh, of the waning relevance of that document. Deus Scientarum Dominus and the revised Jesuit statutes perhaps more than the Ratio Studiorum Superiorum, were therefore the legislative framework within which the college achieved erection as a pontifical Athenaeum in 1964. The difference between this new status and its previous one as a Collegium Maximum was not the ability to admit its students to degrees, but rather its ability to do so for students who were not members of the society. As such, notwithstanding any previous tradition, the college had crossed a line from being a purely internal institution composed of its members of the members of the society only, canonically um, a relatively autonomous zone, especially in the days when the concept of exempt clerical religious institutes still existed, to an institution whose activities included those outside the membership and therefore the jurisdiction of the society. Perhaps partly as a result of this, the local ordinary, the Archbishop of Westminster, became ex officio the Grand Chancellor of the College as an Athenaeum, which was explicitly given two names. In Latin, Athenaeum Heithropense Studiorum Ecclesiasticorum, and in English, the Heathrop Faculties of Theology and Philosophy. It was also provided that the provincial was to be ex officio Grand Vice-Chancellor. Cardinal Heenan was installed formally as Grand Chancellor the following year. Contemporary accounts describe the, the Scarlet Chancellor's gown which may possibly only have been used the once. I've been informed that this made it to Cavendish Square, but not to Kensington, and that its current whereabouts are unknown. <laughs> One aspect of the ceremony, however, which proved, proved late, useful at a later date, the Secretary of State for Education was, was officially represented by a Mr. J.A. Richards, who said, I bring to your eminence from the Secretary of State his most sincere congratulations on your assumption of the office of Chancellor and to the College his warmest good wishes for its enhanced status and role in the higher education of this country. The pursuit of theological and philosophical studies in the College faculties by members of the general public as well as by those of the society will mark a major development in the rich Catholic contribution to English education. The use of the new privileges of the Athenaeum were relatively short-lived. The University of London had made it plain that the basis on which Heathrop was joining the university was that the university's degrees would completely replace the ecclesiastical degrees, and that the practice of a double award of the college's own qualification alongside the university degree, uh, whether with or without further study, was unacceptable. This was notwithstanding the fact that this was the long-standing practice in some other colleges of the university, and still is. Following, the Heath, following Heathrop College becoming College of the University, it was incorporated in 1971 by Royal Charter, with the Provincial as ex officio president, and the Archbishop as its visitor, and the ecclesiastical faculties, whilst never formally suppressed or discontinued, were simply left unused for the next 43 years. 
The de facto manner of the abandonment of the ecclesiastical faculties proved fortunate when, a few years ago, the project to revive them was undertaken. In fact, arguably the biggest obstacle and the reason that the college needed to petition the Congregation for Education in Rome for new statutes, rather than simply reactivate the faculties themselves, was because in the interim, Deus Scientarium Dominus had been swept away in a post-conciliar reform of the universal law in this area. Sapientia Christiana was promulgated by Pope John Paul II in 1979 and covered what were now to be known as ecclesiastical universities and faculties. In other words, those whose degrees were recognised by the Church. Since the revised Code of Canon Law had not yet been completed, we find most of the substantial provisions of this document incorporated into the new Code. The Code also dealt with a new discrete category of Catholic University, which comprised any Catholic Institute of Higher Studies which did not fall within the remit of Sapientia Christiana. Ex Cordia Ecclesiae 19, of 1990 completed these reforms by fleshing out the universal requirements for this second type of institution, which Deus Scientarum Dominus has not really attempted to deal with at all. Accordingly, the new statutes for the ecclesiastical faculties had to be drafted to comply with the provisions of Sapientia Christiana, the Royal Charter of the College, the statutes of the university, as well as all the applicable laws relating to employment and other such matters. As a result, we have the revived ecclesiastical faculties, now with a third name, the Bellarmine Institute, existing as an entity within the college and conducted and controlled by it, but no longer synonymous with the college, as it no doubt was in 1964, with the rest of the college being of the description treated by Ex Cordia Ecclesia, a relatively new regime about which there is still much to be worked out. A certain amount of translation had to take place within the new statutes, as is entirely proper with particular legislation, to bridge the gap between the generic, or perhaps more accurately Roman terminology of Sapientia Christiana, and terminology which might be more readily understood in this country without being confused with the terminology already employed in the college and the university. Thus, the Grand Chancellor of the Ecclesiastical Faculties is to be known as the President of the Institute. In accordance with the prevailing pattern around the world, this is now the Superior General of the Society ex officio, rather than the Archbishop of Westminster, who has become the patron of the Institute. The Provincial remains Vice-Chancellor, but now to be known as Vice-President. The Rector, or ordinarily to be the Principal of the College, is to be known as the Director of the Institute. There is also some adjust adjustment of the titles of Professors within the Institute, again to avoid local confusion. It's difficult to offer conclusions at the end of such a quick trot through the material, so I'll just offer you five brief thoughts to leave you with. One, that the centralisation of the church's legislation in this area is relatively recent. Two, that the Society of Jesus, because of its own well-developed particular legislation, uh, was perhaps better placed to deal with that, this more centralised approach when it arrived. Three, that the accident that the pontifical Athenaeum was simply abandoned turned out to be fortuitous when the time was right to resurrect it in a different form. Four, that the unique combination of the college and the institute reflects a wider reality of church institutions existing simultaneously under two different legal frameworks. And five, that the re-examination of the basic concepts underlying this area of law might allow the rediscovery of a richer understanding of the nature of the academic degree within the context of a general consensus of the universal scholarly community. Again, beautifully within time, and rather disappointingly clean. <laughs> um, would anyone like to ask any questions? Jim. Yeah, just a clarification. If I understood you correctly, you suggested that the document ex cordi ecclesiae, which regulates, by understanding it, Catholic universities rather than um, in their normal faculties, but not their theological faculties, that that document applies to Heathrow College in some way. 
I thought they might get somebody going. Um, that, it's I, not been my understanding. I know, and I've, I, I've, I've come across quite a few people for whom that hasn't been the understanding. Um, I mean, I've, I've read the documents, and my understanding is that it would be within the scope of the document, but that's why I said I think that this is an, these are early days of a new uh, legislative framework that has no precedent, because as I said, the, the 1931 document just didn't cover that kind of institution at all. Um, and it's still very much in the process of being worked out. Um, uh, I think some attempt to work it out more practically in the United States uh, came, became quite messy. Uh, and I don't think there's been a lot of attempt in other parts of the world, maybe because that's not felt necessary, I don't know. But it does seem to me, if you read the documents, that it does apply. Um, interestingly, in 1997, uh, when preparation for the ad limina visit, the bishops were asked um, to list the Catholic universities that came under Excordia Ecclesiae. And they wrote back and said, we don't have any Catholic universities. And um, there was, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a lot here, but something along the lines of nice try. But if you look at the definitions in Excordia Ecclesiae, it says that all the Catholic institutes of higher studies um, are come under, even though they're not called universities, come under the regime. Uh, as a result of which, there was a very interesting um, survey done and, re and returned by the bishops, uh, which I think at that point identified about 17 uh, institutes of higher studies in England and Wales of some type or other, uh, which then went in as part of their report to the ad limina, including Heathrow College. <coughs> Michael Walsh. Well, it's my understanding that Heathrow College is established in London University in 1970 was not technically a Catholic institution. Well, I think that there's the, the, one would need to look at whose definition one is using, um, and I think that. Uh, well, I mean that was a debate. That was exactly a debate. Whether it was or whether it wasn't, was one of the yeah. debates that took place in the course of the uh, uh, in the course of not the negotiation, which happened immediately afterward, and I foolishly me that did it, foolishly talked to Clifford Longley about it, and they got into the Times, where he was then correspondent, uh, saying that they were establishing a Catholic university. And uh, Freddie Copleston, under the then uh, uh, principal of the university, wrote a letter to the Times to say, no, it wasn't. Well, I think that the um, one of the, the difficulties is that you've got, this is the, the reality of living within two, two legal frameworks, two jurisdictions because you can have a different answer to the same question depending on which legal framework you're, you're, looking, you're looking at it from, you're examining with. Uh, and so it's perfectly possible to have an institution which is Catholic in the eyes of one of those two legal systems and not in the other. We have a very similar thing where we have various negotiations from time to time um, about the designation of schools as to whether they're Catholic or not. And there's two sets of designations, one by the diocese and bishops, as to whether it's, it's Catholic in the eyes of the, of the church. And in this sense, using a distinction, uh, there's a designation, a statutory designation process as to whether it's Roman Catholic in the eyes of the Secretary of State uh, and within a legal framework, but a different one. Uh, and so you can, it is possible, and there are examples of it, where you can have two different answers to the same question. And, and I suspect that what, what, what I'm talking about really is what is the answer according to the legislation that came in, uh, in, in, in 1990, which clearly wasn't around when, when the, the negotiations with the uh, university and the council and others um, happened in 1970. Excuse me. Microphone, please, Courage. Here. Uh, thank you. To uh, follow up on this interesting discussion about next Um Ecclesia, could you tell us where the bishops stand on all this? Uh, what is the advantage or disadvantage of being of coming under ex Cordia Ecclesiae? Where, what would the bishops like for Heathrow? Uh, would they prefer? Uh, is, is the problem that there's some sort of Roman, too much Roman influence? Uh, it's I, I'm a bit unclear about the uh, I, I'm terms of the debate and why people would take one side or the other. I'm, I'm here um, today simply as a scholar, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it from, a, from the point of view of, of, of the scholarship of, of the thing. 
Uh, I'm not here uh, speaking on behalf well, of the British. But you should know something about 1997 and where they stood then and why? Well, I, I've, I've seen the documents. Yeah. Excordia Ecclesiae is a document, is a Vatican document, not a document of any particular bishops' conference. So all the bishops' conferences, to my knowledge, have studiously avoided either referring to it or trying to implement it on an overall basis. Certainly in the United States, individual bishops have you know, flexed their Vatican muscles and tried to implement it, largely without much success. Most bishops, in my experience, including some relatively conservative ones, have avoided it because there's a particular, there's an entirely different legal situation of Catholic institutions in the states. They're all Catholic, but they're all separately incorporated under under uh, under boards of trustees. But um, I I heard you say that you know there's a lot to be worked out still there. And my impression is that everybody hopes it's dead letter. Point. I mean, it's full of high-sounding and relatively good advice about a respectful relationship between the institutional church and the Catholic institution. The neuralgic point is the demand that all Catholics teaching Catholic theology in Catholic institutions should acquire a mandate from their local bishop. So as I have heard said and I've even said myself, if you get yourself into that position, you are only an apostasy away from religious freedom. <laughs> David Lonsdale. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask a, a kind of practical, fairly detailed question? Um, for the Bellman Institute, as a as an institute of higher education, dependent on the church or with the authority of the church, does the does canon law provide for any ecclesiastical? inspection regime or quality assurance provision? Um, I don't think there's anything, well, there, there's, a, there's a general, um, uh, there's a general sort of uh, oversight which could be used as a, an inspection regime, but I don't think there's actually any practical, it's, it's not like schools where there's actually a, a, a real practical program uh, and, and uh, a way of, of actually turning that theory into a reality. As far as I know, um, that doesn't exist in the in, in, in this area of law. But does it offer any any rights to say Rome to come along and say, right, we're going to we have a right to inspect what you're doing? Um, I don't think it's anything more than uh, the general canonical uh, right of oversight which would allow, in theory at least, canonically um, a Catholic, the, the appropriate Catholic authority, the local bishop or whoever else, um, to inspect anything that's carried on in some way in the name of the church. Thank you. Uh, Pat, this is the last question. While I agree completely with the last answer, as a former president of a pontifical, as it was then, Ateneum in Dublin, we were subject to visitation, <laughs> um, and it would apply to all the seminaries and colleges of theology in Ireland, and we were visited at that time by uh, Bishop Paul Murphy O'Connor, he was Bishop of uh, Arlington and Brighton, I think, at the time, and visited us with the view to seeing whether or not that which we were reporting every three years to Rome was in fact the case. Uh, it was a visitation, it was a checking, but it was certainly a courteous and friendly one. Uh, but should there be problems, no doubt one would know that those things could be difficult. But the ordinary visitation that is possible for the um, church authorities can be significant. It's not an additional that's provided for Sapientia Christiana. Yes, I think that's right. And I think that, that I would draw a distinction between, um, maybe this is wrong distinction, but I would draw a distinction between in inspection and visitation. And normally inspection is something which is on a particular program and, and scheduled and going on, on on an ongoing basis, where visitation tends to be more exceptional and set up on a, a, on a one-off ad hoc basis. Thank you very much indeed, Paul.